the next conservative MP for the uh, North Island and Powell River, Aaron Gunn. Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Kermit, and thank you for all the support and your endorsement and, and uh, everything that you've done for me over the past couple months. And uh, thank you also for your leadership and your steadfastness up in the city of Campbell River, especially with all of this uh, drug policy insanity that's being imposed by the federal and provincial governments on cities right across this province. And you know, also, thank you to all of you for coming out here today. I know it's a, it's a bit of a dark and gloomy day in Comox, but I can assure you it is not nearly as dark and as gloomy of a day as it is for Rachel Blaney and the NDP. <laughs> You know, for too long, the residents of this riding of North Island and Powell River haven't had the representation that they deserve. But you know, I think you could probably say that for a lot of this country. Because, quite frankly, the last little bit here, it's, it, uh, things have not been going well. After eight long years of Justin Trudeau and his NDP sidekicks, we're really reaping the whirlwind of these policies that have left Canada worse off in almost every conceivable way. And as a result, Canadians are hurting. Canadians are hurting. Or at least most Canadians are hurting. There's some, I guess, that are doing okay. In fact, you know, if, if you're a criminal right now in this country, you're having a great time in Justin Trudeau's Canada. Since he's become Prime Minister, violent crime up 32% in Canada. Why, while shoplifting, vandalism, and an assortment of other offenses have skyrocketed as well. Really, this is the golden age to be a criminal here in Canada. And what has Justin Trudeau done? Well, he's weakened our bail laws. He's made it easier to get bail. He's scrapped mandatory minimum sentencing. And instead, he's gone after law-abiding gun owners. So we have this crime wave in Canada caused in part by the government's own policies, and their solution is to go after the very individuals who by definition aren't involved in criminal activity at all. I've got a different idea. I know it's revolutionary, and you guys are gonna, you know, I'll take it slow so you can follow along here. How about we focus on the actual criminals? How about we actually crack down on crime? And how about we leave law-abiding Canadians alone? <laughs> And for those of you who have even, you know, remotely been following these increases in crime, you'll know it's been fueled in large part by drug and the addiction crisis that has been sweeping this country. Has anyone here seen Canada is dying by chance? So let me, let me just say that the amount of human suffering, pain, and death that's been inflicted by these federal and provincial policies of destigmatizing, decriminalizing, and normalizing hard drug use, including crack cocaine, crystal meth, and fentanyl, is unquantifiable and unfortunately will reverberate for years, decades, and generations to come. And now the liberal NDP brain trust that gave us these policies has another one that you guys may have heard about. It's called Safe Supply. Has anyone heard about this? the safe supply. So at the same time here in BC, we have a provincial government who is suing a company called Purdue Pharmaceuticals for brazenly handing out dangerous and addictive opioids that together across North America have killed hundreds of thousands of people while marketing them as safe. Our federal government is doing the exact same thing, except the opioids that the federal government that Justin Trudeau is handing out, hydromorphone, is two to three times more powerful. And we see the results of these policies. You see them here in the Comox Valley. You see them in Campbell River. You see them from coast to coast. Just here in BC, last year alone, 2,000 British Columbians dead from drug overdoses. 2,000 people. If this is success, what the heck does failure look like? And you know, I've got, a different, I've got a different policy in mind. I think that instead of just handing out free drugs, 
We should try to get some of these people into treatment. We should try to get some of these people into recovery, and we should try to return and help these people return to being productive, tax-paying members of our society once again. But you know, even if we get some of these individuals to re uh, return to our society, and we will, um, hopefully they'll actually be able to afford to live here. Because uh, over the past eight years of this liberal NDP coalition, uh, we've seen Pierre call it the costly coalition, the cost of living in Canada has skyrocketed. Here in Comox, thanks to the regressive job-killing carbon tax, which by the way has been sending our jobs overseas to China, it's harder than ever for families to make ends meet. I was just driving down from Campbell River, I saw gas, $2 a liter. $2 a liter, food inflation in the double digits. It's almost as if when you tax energy, you tax everything that uses energy and requires energy and makes it more expensive as well. I mean, who would have thought, right? But it's not just energy, uh, of course, there's housing. Has anyone seen the housing prices here? It's crazy. You know, my grandfather, when he first came to the country in 19, 1956, and he's 92 years old and he's sitting in the front row right now, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. When he first came to this country in 1956, and I double-checked the numbers with him last night, just to be sure, like many immigrants, and in his case, uh, refugees, you get paid, you start working on the railway, you're getting paid minimum wage or near minimum wage. So it was $1.11 an hour, which works out to about $2,300 a year or so. Just about a year after living here, he was able to buy his first home for just, se and a nice piece of property, I might ask, which he still lives at today, for $7,500, so just over about three years' salary. So today, that would be the equivalent of a minimum wage worker affording a home for themselves and their family for just about $90,000, $95,000. Are there any homes here in the Comox Valley for $90,000, $95,000? Does anybody know? A doghouse. No, maybe a doghouse? <laughs> and unfortunately, that's not the only thing that's changed since 1956. In the 1950s, when my grandfather came here, when he escaped to Canada from the Hungarian Revolution, Canada and the West was a bulwark, a shield against communist and Marxist ideas. Today, we incubate them. Yeah. We do. Today, we incubate them at our universities, in our classrooms, and certainly in the current government, and now most recently, this attack on the God-given right that it is up to every parent to decide how to raise their child, not Justin Trudeau. And just as concerningly have been these attacks on our constitutional freedom, uh, freedom of mobility, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Bill C-11, that nefarious attempt by the Trudeau government to con try to tr control what you think by controlling what you see online. We need to protect our foundational freedoms, we need to scrap Bill C-11, and we need to appoint judges who will uphold our constitutional rights and do their jobs. <laughs> You know, I really think that this country right now is at a crossroads. And I really believe that the next election will be the most important election in a generation. And that is one of the main reasons that I am standing before you today. That is one of the main reasons I've put my name forward. And the other reason is uh, because of an individual that you guys may have heard of, uh, Mr. Pierre Polyev. Now, I first uh, interviewed Pierre in 2021 and have since gotten to know the man that I believe with all my heart will be the next Prime Minister of Canada because I know he has the vision, I know he has the drive, I know he has the tenacity, and I know most importantly, he has the political courage to take on Ottawa's elites, to stand up to the media establishment in this country, especially uh, the CBC and to finally finish the job and defeat Justin Trudeau.
But you know what? He needs our help. We're here right now in North Island Powell River, which somehow is an NDP riding, part of the, uh, this so-called orange wall you may have heard of Vancouver Island. And I was talking to Pierre about it, and he said, Aaron, you know, we need to break through that wall. And I said, Pierre, with all due respect, we don't. We need to shatter it. I have been born and raised and spent my entire life on Vancouver Island. And let me tell you, the NDP has sold out the people here to Justin Trudeau and the federal liberals, and none more so than those who make up the heart and soul of this riding, the resource workers, the miners, the farmers, the loggers, the fishermen, those who put the food on our table and harvest the wood from which we build our homes. And you know, when I was much younger than I am now, uh, I spent a lot of time up here. Miracle Beach, Bottle Lake, Mount Washington, uh, every hockey arena, uh, more times than I can possibly imagine. But it wasn't until about three years ago that I really fell in love with this riding, with this area, and knew that this is where I wanted to make my home and spend the rest of my life. And that happened when I met the people who lived here starting with Mark and Nancy Ponting, who have been so generous in putting up their place here today. <laughs> starting with people like Carl Sweet and Dorian Uzel and others who I met while I was filming a documentary called Loggers, Protesters, and the Fight for Fairy Creek. And since that time, I filmed another documentary a little bit more recently called No Fishing Allowed, which some of you may have seen. And, and when I was filming that, I got to meet another group of individuals, people like Zeke Pellegrin, people like uh, Joel and Melissa Collier, and uh, good old Mil Mickey and his crew of Celtic uh, Seafoods up in Port Hardy. And let me tell you, making those two documentaries, they make them a little differently in the North Island up here. These are, these are salt of the earth, hard-working, tax-paying, law-abiding people on which this country was built on. And the economic hardship and the economic uncertainty and the political games that have been imposed upon them by both the federal and provincial government disgusts me. It disgusts me. But you know what? It's part of a trend in this country. It's part of a trend. If you work hard, if you pay your taxes, if you follow the law, if you're a citizen that contributes to society in any conceivable way, your views don't matter. You're sent to the back of the bus. The government doesn't care about you. And God forbid you've got anything you know, resembling traditional values or you have the gall to be proud of the country that you call home, to be proud of Canada. They call you a dinosaur. Have you seen this? They call you a dinosaur. Well, you know what, if they call that a dinosaur, I say we make North Island Powell River into Jurassic Park, okay? <laughs> so, this is my promise to you. If you uh, get behind me and do me the honor of uh, electing me to be your next representative and, and member of parliament, I will be your voice. I will be your fighter, and I will give it every ounce of strength in my body to be the representative that you deserve. Because right now, Comox deserves better. Courtney deserves better. Merville, Black Creek, Campbell River, Gold River, Powell River, Wass, Sayward, Port Hardy, Port McNeil, Port Alice, Quadra Island, Alert Bay, all 67,000 square kilometers of this, I believe to be the most beautiful riding in the entire country deserves better. And my promise to you, my promise to you is that I will deliver, I will defeat the NDP, and I will help Pierre Polyev defeat Justin Trudeau. Thank you all for coming so much. Thank you very much.